Good afternoon and good evening uh, to our friends from around the world. Thank you for joining us for the second half of today's program, uh, Plastics and Food Packaging. Uh, it is uh, with, with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Johannes Bergmeier. Uh, I'll, I'll read his very impressive CV so I don't, uh, I don't miss anything, but uh, uh, I, I, I have had the privilege of working with Johannes for many years, so uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that he was able to join us today on our program and, and I know his busy schedule. So thank you, Johannes. Nice to see you. Uh, Dr. Bergmeier uh, studied food and biotechnology at the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences in Vienna. He received his technical master's at the Institute for Food Technology in 1999, specializing in quality within the food supply chain. Uh, he's published in many, many magazines, uh, completed his doctorate thesis in the Technical University in Vienna in 2002. Uh, from then, he was employed by the OFI Packaging Institute in Vienna uh, as the industry leader there. Uh, in 2017, Johannes founded his own packaging consulting company named Pack Experts, uh, where he continues to lecture on packaging technology at several Austrian and German universities. He works as a court expert for packaging and as an auditor for hygiene management. Uh, Dr. Bergmeier is a member of the Austrian Standardization Committee on Packaging. Uh, he is the Austrian board member of the World Packaging Organization uh, since 2012, where he has also served as the WPO's Vice President of Sustainability and Food Safety, and most recently in 2018 was elected as the General Secretary of WPO. Dr. Johannes, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Hello, Patrick. So good to see you, and thank you for inviting me. Would be much more nice if I could be there personally, but yeah, in yeah. days like this. For me in Vienna. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you don't want to be in Vienna at these times because it's it's cold and raining and <laughs> <laughs> the end of a of an ugly day. Uh, yeah, welcome to everybody. Happy to be here with you and and to to be allowed to have the possibility to give a presentation. Um, Please apologize me a little bit if my English is not so perfect because I'm not a native English speaker and, and, and especially not a special American English speaker, but I will do my best. But to be true, this is really tricky for this online meeting. Yeah, you know, you are here in, in Austria, we are talking German for sure, whole day. We, I'm thinking in German and then with one click, I have to jump into English. If I'm personalist somewhere, it's much more easier because I got much more trained for, for, for speaking um, English. Thank you, Patrick, for, for the introduction. And I think I have to shorten it, otherwise it's getting too long, uh, just talking me. Uh, what is my plan for, for the next 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, kind of this? And I hope we have also some, some space for some discussion or for, for some questions afterward. A short introduction about WPO. My, my association I'm running for, uh, and then talking about uh, packaging and food safety. And I tried to make a kind of mixture. I was not quite sure how experienced the audience will be. So uh, starting with a little bit basics, then jumping into some more details, especially have a look at the European system for sure, because I think this is the, the most interesting uh, aspect uh, uh, for the audience also in, 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 in US and America. What is WPO? World Packaging Organization, our headline is better quality of life through better packaging for more people. This is really what we are running for. We are convinced that, uh, that our lives are getting better through the, the right quality of packaging and packaging is part of our life. But I think I don't have to explain this in, in this audience. Uh, it's a bunch of really lovely people from around the world. It's a non-profit international body and we are there to uh, promote international cooperation. And I'm happy that uh, uh, we have also a very strong member. I'm not sure if Jane is here, if not, uh, but congratulations Jane again to your big announcement the last days. Uh, we have a strong member also in US, IOPP for sure, yeah. Uh, and this is what we are working on, yeah. By the way, Jane there in the, in the very middle, if you can see her. Yeah. Always happy if we meet there internationally and can talk about 
important things. What are we doing? Yeah, we doing a lot of training nowadays, also online for sure. We had just our first WP online training two weeks ago. Normally we do it in classroom situations like you can see here, yeah, all over the world, but for sure training mostly in, in let's say kind of developing countries, uh, Africa, Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, because in other countries like US or in most European countries, we have quite good education uh, structures or training structures on, on, on packaging technology, not so much in other countries which are coming up uh, uh, in business uh, these days. Another thing you maybe know, hopefully know about WPO is our World Star Award program. Yeah, their one and only outstanding worldwide packaging uh, uh, award where our members contribute because if you win a national award like in US or UK or whatever or in Austria in my country then you're allowed to go into this world star uh, we just had a, a the last uh, uh, um, award ceremony it was normally it's a big life event for sure and we travel all around the world every year in another country this year for sure because of COVID-19 uh, it was done in, in, in internet just uh, one, one and a half month ago, end of August. Uh, and it was also a big success. For sure, it's more fun, again, like such conferences, doing it live. Not only World Star, for companies, for business operators, we also have our students award program. Also worldwide, students are entering this competition to match, to show their packaging design, their new packaging structures, their packaging ideas. Yeah mainly also dealing with packaging in, in contact with food, our, our topic today. And I'm really proud that we can run this program every year and highlight the best students in, in packaging technology. Last but not least, and this is also what I'm coming from, um, is it's about cooperation. Yeah, we have many working groups going on. There is one on education, as mentioned already. There's also one on sustainability. And for sure, if we talk today about, in my presentation, about food safety, but I've seen in your, in your, the whole program, we have many other um, uh, presentations for sure, also on sustainability, yeah, all the circular economy, recycling topics, they are strong, they, are, they have been strong since, since many, many years, but they are much more stronger in the, in the, in the last, let's say, five years. And I'm, I'm sure there, there will be a focus also in WPO like it is now, also for the next five years, uh, discussing this sustainability, uh, circular economy issues and so on. It's a lot about communication. Please look for us. Yeah, we have a good web page, new web page. We are on Facebook. We are mainly on LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn is our, our main. So if you want to learn anything about WPO and, and stay tuned, then, then best is to connect via, via LinkedIn. So this was the advertisement that just to say where I'm based and, and as Patrick mentioned, I'm, I've been a, a, a vice president for sustainability and food safety uh, uh, for, for three years. And now since nearly three years, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be there in charge as, as general secretary. What are we talking about? We are talking about packaging and food safety. Yeah. And as you know, and I think I don't have to mention this, hopefully don't mention this in this round. Uh, why are we packing goods? Yeah, One big issue for sure is to, to, to protect our, our goods. Yeah, Especially if we talk about food, but not only food, even if we pack some, let's say, technical products. Apple just has launched its new iPhone here in Europe. Maybe it's already on the market in the US. They had uh, uh, the, the launch yesterday here in, in, in Europe. You have to pack such an iPhone yeah, because you have to protect it. And that's also true for foodstuffs for sure, yeah, because foodstuffs are sensible goods. Yeah? And so we, we are normally, we are, we are protecting foodstuffs for some, let's say some gases, for, for some corrosion, for some outer, dust and dirt and maybe some gems or some bugs or whatever. But as we also know, as soon as we pack products, there normally is, well, there immediately is a contact between the filling good and the packaging material. And as soon as we have this, and it, we have this protection function for sure, but there could be also a danger, yeah? Because there could be, not only could be, there will be an interaction between that packaging material and the food stuff. You cannot do anything about it. Yeah? It's, it's nature. Yeah? As soon as you have contact between two different materials, there will be an exchange of chemical substances between these. 
this, uh, 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 these materials. And this is what we have to handle. Some examples yeah, to understand or to make it visible. Yeah? We should cook. Yeah, you know, if we talk about foodstuffs, it's always about a little bit about cooking. What are we cooking? Coming from Europe, we cook some Italian style food because I also know Patrick likes it a lot, yeah? eating good Italian food. Uh, let's have some antipasti as a starter. Yeah, you can see here antipasti, it's a paprika thing, yeah, in oil for sure, yeah, as they do it in Italy. Very, very, very well tasted. Some olive oil, I guess. If we open the Pack, yeah, it's a glass jar, yeah, and then we have a, a twist off closure up there, yeah, and uh, for sure, what are we seeing? Oh, what is happening now? Okay, back here. Uh, what we see, there is some red color in there, yeah. You know, there is the the, the closure, the twist off uh, closure is made out of metal, yeah. Uh, it's kind of, of tin, tin steel, kind of this, I guess, with some white lacquer. But here, for the closing system, closing area, we have some plastics for sure. We need them there because otherwise it's not tight and they only will come out of the pack. Yeah. But what normally it's white, yeah, because white is symbol uh, seeing cleanliness, freshness, whatever. But we have this red color. Where is it coming from? Well, not big science, yeah. We can imagine it must come from that pepper, yeah, because they have red color. But what does it mean? It means we can imagine this red color is some chemical. Yeah, it's the red color is something visible. We see it's chemicals that we see and that we see as red color. Yeah, and this red color must be mobile because it it goes it comes out of the pepper is then somehow solved in this oil matter. Yeah, and then also going to the plastic surface. And if you ever had such a product yeah and now you try to let's swipe away with some kitchen towel or whatever that red color you see okay some of that red color is going away but uh, that red color is not only on the surface it's also going into the plastic somehow yeah how can that be yeah and even if you put that that that, that closure into your dishwasher or whatever and wash it five three times ten times yeah there still will be a little bit red color in there yeah why is it like this? Because red colors look like this. And this is where I hit you quite hard already yeah, in my presentation with some chemical uh, chemical details. Uh, you know, I don't, don't know how firm you are in, 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 in chemical structures and chemical writing. Uh, this is a carbon structure. Yeah, it's by the way, it's lycopene up here. It's beta carotene here, very healthy. It's in nearly every red fruits or vegetables we have out there beta carotene for sure it's in carrots yeah good for your eyes by the way yeah it's pro vitamin a so you should eat a lot of it yeah and it's a carbon hydrate structure yeah and if you look back to our plastics what are they they are carbohydrates and that's the truth behind it or that's the reason behind it because there's a big chemical uh, rule if there is some some chemical similar stuff matter yeah then they like each other and then they mix each other. And it's a, it's a way of mixing. Yeah? This red color, if we can go back, is very soluble in that oil because that oil is also, it's fatty, it's not water-based, it's an it's a atlas uh, substance. And so is the plastic in here. Yeah? And this is why these red colors are solving in that plastic, moving in that plastic, and they be there. And if they are there, not go, they don't go away. We can play the same game the other way around if you don't believe me, yeah? because if you pack some other foodstuffs, like this is a deep frozen spinach, yeah? I don't know if you have it also on the on the US market, by the way, but in, in former, or oh, you can find it now in the market too, that spinach is a big block in, a, in such a box, but they also sometimes have these small blocks because then it's easier to pour out and easier to cook. But nevertheless, it's deep frozen spinach. And we have that, that uh, uh, cardboard box there yeah, for deep frozen things. For sure, the main thing is here some, some paperboard, yeah, printed outside, beautiful with some pictures and so on. But again, without plastics, you know, no good, really, really no good packaging without plastic, where it really needs strong, strong, uh, strong jobs to do, like on that inner layer of that, that box, yeah, we need some plastics with polyethylene again. Like by the way, like in that in the twist off uh, uh, cap, I guess it's also some 
in former days it would be, be, be PVC, now it's also PE normal. Yeah? Also this inner layer is PE, so we have plastic there. And again, we see some spots of green color. Yeah? But again, as we know, yeah, this green color, we can swipe it away, we can wash it away. This green color is never going into the plastic. And the plastic is never that greenish, even if you wash it two or three times, like the, like the, like the red twist-off cup. Yeah? Why is it like this? Because that green color is chemically totally different. It's, it's chlorophyll. I hope I spell it correctly in, in, in English. Yeah? And this is a totally different structure. Yeah? This, this is this uh, porphyrine section here, and you have some magnesia in there. So this is water soluble. Yeah? As we know, if you cook that spinach, the green color is going to the water and you can find it in the water, lot of this green color. Yeah? But it's not in love, let's say it like this, with that plastic thing. Yeah? Because the plastic thing is more from the oil fraction, yeah? from the apula fraction. This is polar and so it's water soluble. So you see, if we talk about these interactions, yeah, it's about chemistry. And well, you may like it or not, but you have to handle it if you want to understand it. And if you want to maybe, we, at the end, we come to risk analysis and so on. If you want to, 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 to be aware of that risk and handle this risk, yeah, you have to be aware of this chemical interaction. If you have to understand it and you have to, 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 to minimize them, as we see later in, in, in legal regulations, or even maybe you can play with them. Yeah? Then we talk about active packaging, yeah, because you could also say, okay, normally migration is something we want to avoid. Yeah? If we talk about active packaging, intelligent packaging, more active packaging, then we play with these interactions, yeah, because we, by purpose, we put something. There. This is the schematic thing, and I know it's it's so easy, yeah, because it's again, it, this picture, it's not big science. The calculation behind it and all the migration tests and so on, they are maybe big science. Yeah? But the principle behind it, that we have P, a packaging film, with, as we know, especially if we talk about plastics, but to be true, it's true for all packaging materials. It's also true for paper, for whatever, or for glass or for metals. Yeah? But if we talk about plastics, then we know, yes, this plastic, if we talk about, let's say, a PE film or a PET bottle, yeah? then the gray substance is PET or PE, yeah? but in plastics, we have some other chemical substances in there. It could be also colors like in our pepper, yeah? but you know, there are antioxidants there. There are slipping agents maybe in there. Yeah? There are uh, some other anti-blocking things in there. There may be some, some monomers, some breakdown products from the polymers. And they are small enough and there they can move into the filling group. This is then what we call uh, migration. They also can go outside. Oh, sorry. Should not touch this. They also can go outside to the environment. Yeah. So maybe we can smell something. Yeah. And this could be also a problem because if it smells like bad plastic, nobody likes this. Yeah? There can be also interaction over the packaging, through the packaging material. You know, we know we, we call this permeation. It's not topic of my presentation today, but it's also an own scientific field. Yeah? So the problem is not the plastic itself. There is no interaction because the macromolecules, they are so big, they, they don't uh, uh, migrate into the food stuff or into, into the environment. They are, they are too big to, to move, yeah? But all these small breakdown, mold monomers, oligomers, all the additives we put in there, most of them are small enough to go inside or outside. And the most tricky thing is if they go into side food, because there they could be danger for human health. Because they could be, if we get too much of them, they could be poisonous, they can cause cancer or other serious illness. And this is for sure what we want to avoid. If we think a little bit, normally I do this in a discussion now, but it's not possible today here. Uh, if we think about, and I hope you're aware, what are the factors of increasing or minimizing that migration? Yeah? It's on the one hand side, what kind of material are we using? The less additives we have in there, the less small molecules we have in there, the less can migrate to the foodstuff. So for sure, maybe 
designing of that material with using as less additives as necessary could be a, a, a solution yeah, to minimize that problem. As you can imagine, temperature plays a big role, yeah, a very big role, because if you increase temperature by 10 degrees, you double the, velo the velocity and the amount of migraines going to your food stuff. So it's a big difference if you have deep frozen spinach or some hot filled drink, uh, some hot filled juice, or even something you go into sterilization with 120 degrees or in your baking oven with some, don't know, a PET uh, jar with some lasagna in there or whatever in the oven at 180, 200 degrees Celsius I'm talking about, yeah. Uh, then this, this, this interaction and this migration is much higher. As we learned already, it depends on the filling good, yeah, because it depends on the chemical structure of that migrants, yeah. Are they more soluble in fatty things or maybe more soluble in water-based or in alcohol-based uh, foodstuffs? Then it depends on what kind of chemicals you have inside the food and what chemicals you have on this migration side um, to, uh, to decide how, how much you will find there. Yeah? You know, as an example, we talk a lot about mineral oil uh, contamination at the moment coming out of paper, recycled paper mainly. Yeah? And for sure, these mineral oils, they are oil-based, so you will find them in fatty foods, like chocolate is an example, or in foods because they are, uh, they are volatile, or in foods, food with high surface, like rice or like muesli or something like this, or some breakfast cereals, yeah? But you never will find them in, let's say, mineral water, yeah? because they are not so good. Yeah? And last but not least, if we talk about the factors, for sure, it's also about the surface. Yeah? If you have a small pack, yeah, then you have a quite big surface yeah? uh, calculated onto your amount of filling good. Yeah? And so to, in smaller packs, you have a bigger problem because there's more potential for migration. How are we handling this? Yeah, and we could talk now, but I don't have that much time. We could talk now because if we look as, uh, from my perspective at WPO, World Packaging Organization, we have the same problem or effect worldwide because uh, a bottle in USA is not a different behavior. The interaction is not different from in Europe or from Africa or from Asia. Yeah? We have the same migration. The only thing is maybe it's a little bit hotter in Africa these days than here in Europe, so you have more migration there because it's hotter. Yeah? But what we see, the regulations on this issue, because this is one of the fields where we really have direct regulations on packaging materials, yeah? uh, nearly worldwide meanwhile, but these regulations differ a lot. Yeah? And especially the big problem in my eyes at the moment is that we have a big American-driven, US American-driven system, the FDA system, and the European system. Yeah. I give you more an insight now to the European system because I'm more an expert on this and you know your FDA system. And I also have seen in the in the program tomorrow, I think, you have a presentation on comparison between this European and, and FDA system. And I think this will be, if you're interested in this, uh, join that, that session tomorrow. I think this will be a really good one. What do you see here is the European system. Yeah? How are we reacting on a legal basis uh, for this problem? Yeah, Because governments say, okay, there could be, and you know, in, in the eyes of of the public, plastic is always danger, yeah? not only environmentally, also in, in, in food safety issues. Yeah? Funny why is not the other materials. Yeah? Mainly it's, we are discussing about plastics, although I told you already we have the problems also with other materials. This is the European system. Yeah? And it's, <laughs> maybe you don't see it on one, it's modern art, I always say. Yeah? Uh, we in Europe decided to make some on the rooftop yeah, this is the section up here, some general rules on all food contact materials, and then some specific rules on different types of food uh, contact materials, like plastics, but also maybe sometimes on paper. Yeah, there is something in the pipeline for paper and food contact on European level. Yeah? They promise it to publish it since two or three years. It's still in the pipeline because also of the mineral oil discussion, but we will have it in some some years, maybe, yeah. There are something on elastomers and rubbers. There is some for coatings for tin cans, yeah, or some twist-off clothes that we have seen, yeah. 
But on the other side, on the European level, there are many of these materials are not regulated directly. This is also a big problem we have in Europe at the, at the moment. We have no regulation for printing inks, as an example. And this is already a big difference uh, to the US American system, but because there it's not so much material based, it's more chemical and use based. Yeah, which chemical you use for which packaging for which type of food stuff. Yeah? The European approach is a little bit more general. This could be an advantage, this could be a, a disadvantage. Yeah? Maybe we can discuss this. What is the, the central thing in Europe? We say we have this framework regulation 1935, 2004. Yeah? And there it says it's very, very basic, I guess. Yeah, it says they should such food packaging materials. Yeah, should be in compliance with good manufacturing practices (GMP). Is there any explanation what is GMP in that regulation? No, it just says we have to do it in GMP. But I can give you an impression. Meanwhile, it was published in 2004 for this regulation. Meanwhile, we know much clearer what they mean with GMP, and there is now a standard how to say what is GMP. Yeah? But the more interesting thing are these three points. Yeah? If we have such a food contact material, such a food packaging, then it should, then there is an inter interaction. It does not say this regulation, the, a chemical interaction between food contact material and the food stuff is, is not allowed, it's forbidden, yeah? because this would be not realistic. There is interaction. But we have to limit this interaction so that human health is not in danger. That sounds very logical, yeah. But on the other hand side, it's a big burden, yeah, for packaging producers. Because if I bring a packaging on the European market, I have to be sure that my package is not endangering human health. How to prove? Yeah? Because endangering human health is not only somebody is drinking from my bottle and falling down dead. Yeah? It means also he should, this person should, this consumer yeah, should not get any cancer in 30 years. Yeah? And how can you prove this ever? Yeah? So as you can imagine, and I cannot go too deep into this below, this is then a very high sophisticated system of how handling this uh, it mainly we come up with this, that we have lists of chemicals that we are allowed to use or not allowed to use, or that we have to meet some migration limits and so on. Yeah? But this comes all down, it's, it, it's broken down to the point, such a material should not endanger human health. And this is, I think it's quite wise, yeah? but not so easy to reach. It should also not change uh, unacceptable the composition of the food. So even if, if it's not a danger for human health, but if it's changing the food, if our, our, our bottled milk is no milk anymore, but it's milk contaminated with some packaging ingredients, <laughs> some, let's say, some, some, yeah, some adhesive components, some chemicals out of a package, even if it's not endangering human health, yeah? it's just mixing with the product, and the product is then not pure anymore. It's not pure milk anymore. It's not pure water anymore. It's, it's, it's contaminated water, and we are not allowed to bring this on the market, and we should avoid this. Again, very basic thing, very logical. You agree with me, good idea to do this, but how to prove? Not so easy. And also the organoleptic characteristics, so it should not have a bad smell or bad taste. Yeah? I think we also agree on this. Okay, talking too much already. What is also in there? Yeah, we have to 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 sign such uh, such uh, materials. Yeah, because it ends up that we have maybe some materials designed for food packaging. Yeah, and how can we we differ? How can we see if a bottle is made, let's say, for motor oil or for for mineral water? Yeah, maybe. If it's really a bottle, you can you can judge it by the shape, yeah. Because if you have, let's say, a bottle for Coca-Cola, you know if there's the typical Coca-Cola shape, you know this is a Coca-Cola bottle, even if nobody writes Coca-Cola on it. Yeah. But if you go one step back, yeah, let's say you have some resin, yeah, some PET resin, yeah. You don't know is it now for food contact, is it a food growth quality, whatever. That means we need some ideas how to label this, how to sign, how to make clear. This is now food contact material and not, nothing else. This is some in the regulations. And also because of the tricky thing that we have to be sure that these materials are really not endangering human health. We in Europe came up with the idea, okay, what we need is some declaration of compliance. We need some paperwork. Yeah? 
because the material itself, the resin, yeah, you cannot write on it and you cannot show what, what is it made for? Is it made for mineral water? Is it made for soft drinks? Is it made for oil maybe? And we heard already, this is a big difference. yeah. Or is it made for hot filling or not? Yeah. We need this information. It's about, it's about information, it's about communication. So legal bodies try to, to trigger, to regulate our way of communication in the supply chain. Yeah? If I'm producing a plastic resin, I have to communicate with my customers, which make bottles out of it, that they know what is tested already, what is this material made for. Yeah? And so we have these regulations on how this information has to run. Yeah? We have for plastics, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, this picture here with this with this this iceberg in here. Yeah, it's a colleague of mine has has created this picture because uh, there is a lot of information. Sorry, it's in German. Yeah, but it's embedded in the picture, and I have time to to correct it. But I think you understand it. Yeah, it's a lot of information. Uh, let's say a plastic producer is collecting because he knows the raw materials uh, he is using and he knows the production processes and he knows the additives going in there and he has done many tests and trial runs and whatever so a lot of information but this is information is like an iceberg yeah like six seventh of that iceberg is below the waterline you cannot see it because it's just in that in, in in the company inside the company of the plastic producers but out of this important information, he's creating a, what we call declaration of compliance. So a summarized report on the important information about food contact, with which, which food contact is possible for that material. Yeah? And this part is visible. It's visible for the next step in the supply chain. So the producer of a bottle or the filler of a of, a, of, a, of, a, of such a bottle uh, that he is enabled to use that material correctly. Or maybe do some additional tests or search for some in, in, uh, additional information which he hasn't at the moment, yeah? because nobody's thought about it that this material would be used in that application. So it's about information yeah? in nowadays, for sure. And it's about traceability. Yeah, I left this in because we will see it also just if we talk about GMP. Yeah, uh, I think this is a basic thing. If we want to have safe materials, food safe materials, safe materials for, for, for food industry, we must, uh, uh, we must keep the traceability. In my experience, yeah, at least in Europe, yeah, and I'm sure also in the US, I guess this is not a big issue. Yeah? When these regulations was launched, these new regulations in, as I mentioned, 2004, 2005, 2006, this was a big discussion. Oh my God, how can we do it? Nowadays, 15 years later, nobody's really talking about it. You have to be sure that you know which raw materials from which supplier you take, producing your food contact material, producing your bottle, as an example, and to whom you have sold it. Because if there is any problem in there, yeah, always we are producing industrially, something can happen. Yeah? We must be able to take things back from the market or get some information why we have this problem because we use some special raw materials and we use these raw materials maybe also for other patches and other products. So these are also affected by the problem and that means we also can take these materials from the market. So again, it's about information, information technology, funny guys. So let's talk a little bit more about GNP because there is then also a GNP regulation, yeah, which is not very high sophisticated. It's one page, yeah, it's a really a one pager, yeah. But it drives us to the to the situation that I want want conclude to already, and it, because it gives meanwhile a a little bit not a perfect but a bigger picture meanwhile, yeah. Uh, what European legislation say, we need something like quality assurance system and quality control system. If we producing food contact materials, and that means really from the very ground material, that means from the plastic resins, yeah? If we produce plastic resins and then some preliminary products and then some half side products and then bottles and then fill these bottles or whatever, on every step, we cannot just produce as we like and, and as the mood we feel on that day. 
Yeah, we have to define it. We have to define our raw materials. We have to define our processes. Yeah, and we have to check regularly if this what are we using and this what are we really producing out of it is if it's meeting our expectations, if it's meeting our specifications. And this is the the the, 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 the tricky word, I guess. We have to specify everything we are doing. Otherwise, we never have to change the chance to find out what is going on and where maybe some mistakes are, are given. What the European authorities also put in there is documentation because they maybe want to come and check us, control us, yeah, and they need this documentation. Uh, but sometimes we also maybe need us if there is a problem, if we have, if we don't have the documentation, we cannot find out what was really the problem in the past and, and what, to, what to avoid. And I cannot focus on this. This just has been now the general section up there. And then the idea of the Europeans is to make some, some if you see it here vertically, yeah, some special regulations as example on plastics. And we can talk now, and I hope that my colleague tomorrow is, 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 is comparing that a little bit. Uh, you know, we have this very high sophisticated system of, of uh, um, food simulants there that we bring them in contact with the materials for some certain time at some certain temperature and see what's going on. Is there some migration? And if some limit is, uh, 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 is not met, then this material is not allowed on the market high sophisticated system, we could talk for hours on this, um, but just to, to mention as an insight, because I want to, to give my speech at the end in a little other turn, yeah? because what showed up in many countries worldwide yeah, it, in the last years, and maybe it's even because we have this, this different uh, legal regulations in deep, different countries or even areas. Yeah, yeah, the American system, the European system, the much more stronger upcoming Chinese system for sure, yeah, which is very similar to the European system, but they make everything a little bit stronger. Then there is a special system in South America. There's a system in, in, uh, in, in Australia and New Zealand. They have their own approach. The Japanese have their own system. Yeah, it's a very traditional one, and, and, and they do it for, for, for many years since the 60s and 70s. And so they have some old, I call it traditional rules yeah, on, on food packaging materials. There's not so much going on in Africa, to be true. Yeah. But if we see on that landscape, then there is one international strategy to maybe combine it, and this is hygiene management and hygiene management standards. Yeah. Um, this is also, I come again with a, an idea how we do it at the, at the moment. It's for sure, it's mainly driven by the ISO 20002 system, uh, uh, 22,000 system, sorry. Uh, and the standards like EFS, BSC and so on, they go in the same direction. Meanwhile, it's even coming backslash up to the legal requirements because it's not a regulation European, but it's a recommendation European where they say, yes, even Packaging producers, they are part of the food chain. They should be also in line with that food safety management approach we have there. Yeah. This pyramid, it's, it's a picture out of that, out of the recommendation, shows uh, the idea of such of, of the food management systems we have, which is given by ISO 22,000. 22, yeah. It's based on the one hand side on, on the risk assessment, yeah, HACCP, yeah, hazard analysis and critical control point system. I hope you are somehow familiar with it. I just have one chart on this. And, but on the other hand, some basic principle we should follow. And again, there is what they call prerequisite programs, PRPs. Yeah, it's also a, a wording coming out of, uh, out of that ISO standards, yeah. They also call it GMP and some other principle we have heard all, already about it. It's about communication, traceability, uh, preparedness for uh, uh, for dangerous situation, for crisis situations like we have now in COVID at the moment. Yeah? And again, we could talk about this topic now for hours and hours and make uh, whole trainings out of this. Yeah, if it comes down to packaging, yeah. We have found out in the last year that it's mainly based on these prerequisite programs. Yeah, it's not so much that we have so many real 
uh, risks in in line with this this packaging production process. It's more on prerequisite programs that we handle. You have the list. I don't want to go through all the list. We have some infrastructure things. It's about cleaning. It's about pest control. All the things we have in these hygiene standards. Yeah, but it's fine to have this list because you can work on it and see. Okay, in my packaging production, do I have some answer for this question? Do I have some answer for this? risk which are there and i don't have to think so much is there really a big risk on my special product if you're in the food chain you should handle this risk because they are relevant if not for your own protection for your own packaging protection it's relevant for your customers and for the consumers which are on the very end of this of this supply chain and but for sure if you look at this pyramid we have this 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 prerequisite programs as a basis and communication and also training and so on and down there. But for sure on the top, there is still this idea of risk assessment. Uh, and you know, it's the difference between hazard and risk. I think you know the, the example with the shark, yeah. Uh, for sure it's a hazard if you are on the, um, uh, on the beach, yeah. Uh, and there is a hazard that a shark could come and bite you, yeah. But the risk is quite low as long as you stay on the beach, yeah. For sure, as soon as you go swimming, then it's much easier for the shark to reach you. Yeah? And then the risk of getting uh, 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 bitten or, or even eaten, swallowed by a, by a shark is much higher yeah? uh, because you're into the water and the shark is too. And you know, this hazard and risk thing, if we talk now about all this COVID on Corona discussions, we have many people don't have the insight in that difference. Yeah? This is also one big problem we have now. So this is the situation we have at the moment, I guess, if we talk about global trends on food safety, yeah, on the one hand side, you have a quite split, you have one problem, one issue, it's mainly about chemical interaction, migration. You have very differing legal responses in different regions, in America, in Europe, in, in, in Asia, and maybe, maybe it's mentioned in China, yeah. And on the other hand side, we have a quite global understanding, meanwhile, already what means food safety and how can we handle this. And this is mainly given not so much in the common quality standards and not so much in, a, in regulations like the European GMP regulation. It's mainly in the international driven standards like DSCGS for packaging materials or that FSSC 20,000, 22,000. It's difficult for me <laughs> a system in, in, in we have on, on the ISO level. And also just to give you an idea what is in there, the standards are, they are all different again, yeah, but they have the same things inside. Yeah. Uh, I just copied you out the fundamental clause of PSCGS. I'm just in a PSCGS audit today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Um, so this is my evening program for today, having this speech. Uh, it's about senior management. It's doing this hazard risk analysis. It's, again, it's about specification. So you see, it's it's the same thing like in the legal, legal requirements we are talking about. Yeah, It's about traceability. It's about uh, PRP things like housekeeping, uh, process control, and training and so on. One last picture, just to get the connection to WPO again. Yes, we're talking about the food safety thing. It's very important. Yeah, It's a little bit kicked out nowadays by the environmental discussion. Yeah? And one other very important thing for me, what we should not forget about if you're talking about packaging, don't be too much afraid of the risks we have in food packaging. Yeah, They are handled able yeah we can manage them there are ways to manage them because if we use packaging correctly and this is this picture from africa from our, our colleagues from 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 kenya from joseph yeah uh, because we have another program it's called packaging that saves food yeah because packaging is protecting foodstuffs yeah and if you read through the text below there it says that by just using these sex plastic bags yeah for corn yeah they reduced food losses by 30 to 40 percent yeah and if you imagine how important is this in countries like in Kenya, yeah, where people are still starving, yeah, and this problem will become much bigger in the in the next year when population is growing, still growing, yeah, then we need packaging, yeah, because it's such a fundamental thing to improve our lives. But on the other hand side, we have to be sure 
that this packaging is safe. And this is possible, we can do it. Uh, and there are meanwhile some international approaches where you can be in line and then you can handle this thing uh, quite correctly. So this is my finish, much too long, oh yeah. Sorry for this. Johannes, thank you. You you never speak too long. I could uh, I, I could listen to you talk all day. You have uh, you have so many great insights. Uh, your your last slide actually addressed one of the questions that that I had on how we balance the the environmental concerns with uh, packaging's role in in keeping our food safe and and uh, and making it accessible and preserving food for for access to more people. I think it's. Uh, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, what I what I would encourage our attendees is uh, uh, to, if you are not yet connected with the World Packaging Organization or with your National Packaging Institute, um, please do that because uh, there there are very many shared insights and, and uh, uh, good information that comes from uh, the, the group of WPO members getting together. And, and uh, Johannes is a very good resource for that, and he's. Uh, He's always happy to share his insights on, on those things. So I, I encourage you to, to be in touch with him. Johannes, if you have a, a moment for a couple of quick questions that have come in from our- yeah, sure, 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 sure. Can, can you comment please on the uh, migration yeah. concerns for water and oil emulsion products? Sorry, again, I, do I have the question somewhere? It, in the Q oh, and A. In the question, ah, yeah, sorry. Q &A, it's, this, it's this first one there on the- Migration concerns of water and oil emulsion. Oh yeah, uh, uh, emulsion things is 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 quite tricky. Yeah, because they are, you know, we have these big two big families. I say they are the oil-based foods and the water-based foods, so polar and apolar. If you have the emulsion products, yeah, then it can be a, a mixture like milk. Yeah, and we learned this, I guess, from the ITX crisis we had in the two thousand five, two thousand six. Yeah not to underestimate that there could be some some foodstuffs which not behave like you would expect it on the on the on the first uh, on the on the first moment yeah or the first idea so the answer normally on this is you just have to to choose your 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 right uh, migration simulant yeah as we use it in europe uh, the, the right testing method and that means also sometimes you have to use maybe two or three testing methods in parallel yeah and see where you have the, the, where is the worst case, and this is then your limit. Yeah, I guess this is the, this is the question. Interesting, the answer. thank you. Uh, per, perhaps one more, if, if you could. Yep. Uh, we typically define packaging barrier in terms of oxygen transmission rate and moisture vapor transmission rate. Are there any quantifiable barrier markers for polarity and flavor volatiles? Sounds like this one may mean <laughs> some some more time. <laughs> Maybe Good it's okay. question. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Uh, if there, yes, sure. There are some. There are some 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 flavor tests. Yeah. Some some defined flavor tests. But to be true, uh, and and yeah, you should again. You should you should have a look for the worst case. Yeah. That means uh, you should look for a molecule. Yeah. Um, What's the right English word? What what is the, the in peppermint? What is the chemical structure? It's menthol. Men is yes. it called yeah. menthol in, in, in English? Yeah. Uh, this is one of this of these examples of the chemical, which is used quite quite frequently. Yeah. Uh, because it's a very small molecule, so it's it's going easy through. Yeah. And then again, it depends. You have to understand their interaction a little bit. You have to understand what kind of packaging material I have. Yeah. Because PT is a different structure from PE. Yeah? PT quite polar structure, PE quite apolar structure. So again, you should design again a worst case, yeah, and find a molecule, yeah, where you say, okay, it's small enough, it's it's uh, uh, um, it's mobile, yeah, easily mobile, and it's it has that polarity that goes easy through my packaging material. And then you can use this and oh, and the last important thing for sure, you need a detection method for this chemical, yeah, so that you can see is it really going through my 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 packaging structure. But this is maybe sometimes a little bit tricky because you have to investigate a little bit what to take uh, 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 best, yeah. But at the end, it's based on that chemical principles uh, of of diffusion, yeah, and interaction, and and you can solve this. 
Very good. Well, I hope you'll you'll join us again for a future program, and uh, we'll we'll take some more time delving into some more of these issues. So, uh, again, thank you very much for for joining us. It's good to see you again, Martha. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have a nice bunch of rents. Bye bye. Ciao, Patrick.